So we're going to kick this one off, Rabbi, uh, with the with the question about the Quran. Does do, does the Quran say that towards towards the Muslims, um, Christians are the kindest and Jews are the most hostile? And you know, with that question goes, I think about these things uh, because you see things like about the Temple Mount being overtaken and all this other stuff, and it kind of makes you wonder. What does the Quran teach? I mean, I know you had a really amazing, amazing explanation uh, of Islam and stuff last week uh, towards the end of the program, about an hour and forty-five minutes in. In fact, I watched it again last night. It was just so it was it was pretty deep. Um, so, with with all this said, there's you know there's going to be uh, speculations and stuff regarding um, different things you see on the news. And such. I mean, we have we have there's Christians who there's Christians who are extremists uh, who go off and do crazy things in the name of Christianity. Uh, you know, the same with messianics, and you know, probably with every every sect of people, even non-religious people, you have the extremists and the non-extremists altogether. So, um, and one thing that I learned very clear is just because you're wearing a Muslim T-shirt doesn't mean that you're a Muslim. Just because you classify yourself as that and you're acting negatively on their behalf doesn't mean that they accept what you're doing. So, uh, this will be a, a really another good lesson for us all to learn about what does the Quran teach? Because that's what they're supposed to be going by. That's a, that's a very, very interesting question. Um, in fact, it, it says that in the Quran, there's a passage, a very famous and extremely controversial passage in a famed chapter. It's the chapter, Surah chapter 5. It means chapter, basically its title means in English the, the set table. It's an enormous chapter. I believe it's 120 passages, and it covers an enormous uh, spectrum of teachings. That means uh, the, this chapter begins with uh, instructions for Muslims, uh, for followers of the Prophet Muhammad, how they should behave, what is forbidden to them, what they may do, what they may not do. They're forbidden to gamble, to drink alcohol, and many, many other things, of ritual purity. It means a lot of, as we find in these early chapters that are very large in the Quran, they are pregnant with Islamic law. Um, the, the chapter then turns, and just a point about the Quran, for those who are, who are not familiar with it, you can't, the Quran, unlike other oracles, you can't just pick up a Quran and lean back and go, oh, I, <laughs> let me just do some light reading. Now, the Quran is used by our cousins, the Muslims, as our sacred literature, the Jews, the book of Psalms, which the Muslims hold and as an extremely holy book. Um, so the Quran is used, of course, in a sense of prayer and recital with a, a tone of music, just like the Jews have a trup, a musical trup, and so on. But for study, to understand what the Quran means, and it requires enormous study. It's not, it's, this is not light reading, if you understand what is being conveyed. And it, it is not, uh, this is extremely important, it is not a, a book that is, that runs in any kind of chronology. There's not even a hint of chronology in the Quran, which means you can have a chapter uh, in the early part of the Quran that actually is referring to the end of, uh, is des describing an event that happens at the very end of Muhammad's life. And where this passage comes from that you're describing where the passage says essentially that um, that uh, you, and it's speaking to Muslims here, it's addressing Muslims, you will find the Jews and essentially the idol worshippers, the pagans, to be the most hostile uh, to, this, to the message, essentially. And you will find the Christians most affectionate. And then there's a modifier at the very end of the passage that says, uh, because the among the Christians are the priests and the monks, and they're not arrogant. Okay, So it's explaining why the 
the Christians, it's, it's not like every Christian world, but it's saying because they are, will be the most affectionate because specifically because of Christian ecclesiastical leaders. I'm going to go. Now, this is a very troubling text, not for what it, it seems to be, like is it anti Jewish or so on, and saying Christianity. It's not, this is very complex because the commentators, which are called the tafsir, in Arabic. It's like the uh, Mepharshim in Hebrew. And actually, there's a very similar word in, in Arabic. So Hebrew and Arabic are, are closely related. They all are... Oh, they all stop. I mean, you can just read volumes on this passage. What does it mean? And I'll explain to you why this presents an enormous conundrum. But just the point must be made, and that is that this chapter, although it's chapter 5, it is a very late chapter chronologically. It was written at the end of Muhammad's life. There is a little disagreement over if this is really the last chapter of the Quran, or maybe 110 is the last chapter, means the 110th surah, but it's but it is at the very end, which means that this is a chapter that was written in Medina. Muhammad moved from Mecca to Medina in 622, and he passed away in 632. So this chapter is written, let's say, it's somewhere between 630 and 630. I mean, really at the end, really at the very end of his life. Now, this has enormous has an enormous impact because the chapter is, the question is, is this passage referring to what what was happening at the moment. It is, is it historically anchored to that time, that at that time, Muslims' final prophet is encountering Jews who are arrogant like pagans and Christians, or particularly priests and monks who are affectionate? Or does this mean every Jew for all time are hostile and Christians are affection because they're so their their priests and monks are so nice. Now, there are a few exceptions, but uh, there are hundreds and hundreds of is of Islamic commentators. I, I don't even know the number. In fact, there are so many commentators on the Quran that most of it has never even been published and still sits in manuscripts from centuries and centuries ago. I mean that's how much there is. But on this, every single commentator from the earliest period to the classical period is asking the most obvious question. How could this possibly be speaking about all time? The Jews are the most hostile to Islam and Christians are the most affectionate. And Now the reason why this is this virtually, I'm not going to say every, but virtually all the giants, all the giants of the Islamic commentators say this was speaking about that time, and at that time, uh, there were uh, Muhammad engaged in wars with a number of tribes, uh, three of them in particular. Uh, it's not germane to this book as exactly what happened, and so on, the, the Battle of the Trench, and so on. And there was a, a monk and a priest at that time who did convert to Islam. The reason why it is impossible for virtually, now there is one or two exceptions, but there is because the Jews didn't do any of this stuff, meaning Jews have been living in the Islamic world before Islam, meaning Jews have been living in the Arabian Peninsula for thousands of years before Muhammad, during the Jahiliya when Arabs were worshipping hundreds and hundreds of gods, which is widely discussed as Islamic sacred literature and so on. And the Christians were at war with the Muslims for hundreds of years. For example, I mean, how could this be? The Jews weren't fighting with Muslims. I mean, throughout history, the Jews live peacefully side by side. Today, let's not, let's not make up stories. Today there's a problem, unfortunately, tragically, there's a problem in the Holy Land, it's a very serious problem, but this is a modern issue, a political issue, and please God, the Mashiach will come and God will bring that to an end, and I believe that's how it That's not germane to the show. The key point is that when you're dealing with, when, you, when, you, when, um, when Muslims think, they go, what, the Jews lived in Yemen, they lived in... They live peacefully side by side with the in 
in, well, throughout the Islamic world, if my family was not in Eastern Europe during World War II, if my family was in the Arab world, they would have not gone up in Hitler's ovens. If they were living in in Baghdad, they would have survived. If they were living in, they would have been they would have been fine. The Jew, my family was in Eastern Europe, and the Nazis sent my almost all of my family up in in a in a chimney. So and and but. While Jews and Muslims shared a very long history that was very peaceful, it does not mean, and this is a point, that there were no problems ever. There were some crazy moments, the 12th century, those Almohads, there were some crazy Islamic heretical sects that there were problems at times, so don't think that it was absolutely, but it was, life was great. Jewish life in the Arab world was great. The problems we see today have n nothing to do with what Jewish life is like. They were, Jews were a protected people in the Islamic world for a very long time. But on the other hand, the Islam, the, the Muslims, the Arabs were fighting. You had a war of the Spanish reconquest that began in the 8th century in, let's say, um, I think around, what is it, 710? and lasted for 700 years, for 700 years in the Iberian Peninsula. You're talking about, imagine going to war for seven centuries? <laughs> imagine the, the Crusades, how many millions that they, did the church murder in the Crusades? Now, Jews were slaughtered by the church, too, in the Crusades. Do you have any idea what the Crusades did to the Arabs? And they slaughtered them, murdered them. At the point of a sword, they converted them to Christianity. By the way, when you see Christian Arabs, let's say, in the Holy Land, these are really the result of the Crusaders that converted them, and then they became Christians. How did, they, how did an Arab in, in anywhere in the Middle East ever become, how was they a Christian? I mean, there's a number of reasons, but the Crusades were largely responsible for it. Jews didn't have, there was no, nothing remotely, I mean, it's not even remotely, That's, there's no word even describe it. Jews had a very good life. Again, there were certain very difficult moments, but they're very punctuated. They're the, they're the exception. Jews had a fantastic life in the Arab world, and this, is, of course, makes this passage, the tafsir, from virtually top to bottom going, it is impossible, because of what I've just shared with you, this passage is not referring to the Jews in general of all time, but it's referring to that particular time where there were difficulties, and it doesn't mean Christians at that time were all goodies. In fact, earlier on in this surah, in surah 5, the, 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 we are told in the Quran that Christianity is attacked, attacked for its beliefs, meaning attacked for deifying Jesus, for worshiping him, for worshiping, making a messenger into God, worshiping Mary as a deity. I mean, so just understand, we're here at, at Surah 5, verse 82, but what I always teach is whatever you're going to study, you have to study in context. So the context is that theologically, theologically, the Jews are, are, are criticized severely for not behaving properly. And, in fact, interestingly, the Quran says that the Jews should return to their book, to their holy scriptures, to live their life properly in verse, in verse 48, for example. But here we have a very brief passage, and the passage clearly is understood by virtually all scholars that this was not referring to all times, but this is referring to that time, which means at the end of Muhammad's career, prophetic career, meaning, let's say, somewhere between 630, this is a very critical time, 630, 631, 632, this is what we'd expect it to be, and it was because there was a, a famous monk at the time, a Christian monk who did convert to Islam at the time, and there were difficulties on the other time, so therefore it is, the text is universal. Almost, not universal, but almost universal. And if you read it in context, it's very clear that this passage is not referring to the Jews of all time or hostile like pagans and the Christians are wonderful of all time because there's monks and, and priests that are nice guys. Because that's impossible. That's impossible because why? Because 
Christian priests and monks told the crusaders, the French crusade, that's the first crusade, slaughter, kill, and they'll give you eternal life. And they went with their shields with with the blazing cross and then slaughtered everybody in their way, making their way to the Holy Land. So therefore, it's I say this, uh, that it's the, the Quran, this is a warning to anyone. It has to be studied very, very carefully. I'm not saying it's every person, but if someone wants to understand it, it requires a very uh, great study. Two, it is not a cohesive book. It does not read like the five books of Moses. It doesn't. It is... It's out of order. You can be in the middle of a surah, in fact, and suddenly, bang, you're turning to it another direction completely. You could be in the same surah where, learn, where we are, what is being conveyed is Sharia, which means Islamic religious law, which this chapter begins with. And then suddenly it's turning to history and it's turning to Christian theology in general, condemning Christianity and Christian beliefs and practices complete idolatry, condemning those who venerate Mary. And this is very critical because in in the Quran, Mary is highly, not venerated is not the word, but is extolled is the right word. In fact, I believe that she is the only female in the entire Quran of 114 surahs that's ever mentioned by name. Now, there are other females in the Quran, but they're just called the daughter of the prophet, the wife of the prophet. They're, they're, they're not really called, they're, of, they're not, but by name, she, they have the whole chapter that's just named after. But despite this, that she is regarded in Islam as a, an extraordinary person who even the devil could not touch, and so on, it's much more elaborate than that. But the Quran condemns anyone who would ever deify or worship Mary, who would ever deify or worship Jesus, who would ever worship the three, meaning the Trinity. So <laughs> there's, believe me, that, and here you have the Quran, which means it's conveyed after the advent of Christianity. I just say to my Muslim friends, we were dealing with them for 600 years before. <laughs> but anyway, the key point is, is that this is what's condemned before it, and then there's a, a major shift. And the shift, the, con the reason why it does fit in some way is that the, the chapter does move from talking about laws regarding to Muslims who are called believers and how they should behave, what they can eat, drink, how, what is forbidden relations to them, what is permissible, and so on. We don't need to get into that. The, the, the cohesiveness in this is that it begins to speak to the people of the book. That's where there's a shift mid-surah. Mid, mid but then, as Christianity is condemned for, I mean, Christianity, Trinitarian Christianity, the idea that Jesus even was crucified, the idea that he died for your sins, which we already have, that's a fake and a fraud, we already told in the last surah. So in this surah, we have these, this punctuated moment where, again, again, according to Islamic tafsir, and it's blatantly clear that this text is speaking about that particular time that there were, there was a, and we know it historically, there was a monk who in fact had become converted to Islam and it had an enormous impact on the moment, but it was not, this, these passages are not to be understood for all time, but rather specific, they are specifically, they are indigenous, they are anchored to that moment. That's why I just, one other point I must say, please, and that is, I, I think, I think you realize now that how vulnerable the Quran is and how vulnerable other literature that's sacred in to Muslims are. Because when you have texts that suddenly spin and turn, and you have to really study them very carefully, it is not difficult for a moron, for in a, a moron, heretical Muslim to take a text, I'm being straight, giving you straight, a guy in Syria, God forbid, in ISIS, who Muslims consider to be uh, the despise them. I mean, every Muslim I know hates them because they are an abomination to Islam. But, don't be foolish. The Quran is very vulnerable. Because of the nature of this literature, it is much more vulnerable to misuse than other literature. The Hadith as well. That means there's biography, sayings, and, 
and uh, and tacit approval. These texts are extremely vulnerable to misuse, and you can be sure that in history, and I'm being straight, we're, we're families, I'm talking to my cousins now, you could be sure that if there was a Muslim in history, it's not that, by the way, Jews have, I'd be glad we can go to competition in the Olympics and see who has more nut jobs, believe me, but we're just discussing this, that it's very easy to understand how if a Muslim was warlike and he was violent and his heart was filled with hatred, he can easily take this passage, which appears in Surah 5, verse 82, and easily use this because he's a hater, because his heart is filled with hate, because he really wants to be at war and he wants to kill, and because he is an enemy of God and he does not follow the teachings of God, he can explore these texts to this day in order to to give him the drug he needs and say, I'm just quoting the Quran. It's completely out of context. Doesn't understand it. So these that's what you need people to understand that the Quran can't be just like this read. And those who abuse it and do use these texts from different areas and oracles of, that are that are sacred to Muslims, they're very easy to abuse. It seems to me like they're, they're just like in any other religion um, that you have different denominations forming within different groups of people. And so, uh, would it be safe to say that then in uh, Islam that they're possibly doing the same thing, like the whole ISIS thing? I mean, they've got a lot of people claiming to be Islam. But, you know, maybe it's because they decided to look at the Quran differently and get their own understanding out of it. I mean, there's people all the time saying, you know, the, from what I hear, it's just the opposite. You know, it says any kind of uh, uh, person who is really dedicated to Islam would actually be, number one, rebelling against the the, the Torah itself uh, and also completely does not like the Jew at all. And so uh, and then you have the situation with the Temple Mount, uh, you know, situation. Could you could you touch on that just a tear, just a little well, first of all, the Temple Mount situation is completely political. I mean, I mean, let's just, we have to be clear. The the problem that's happening today in the whole, and anyone will tell you, I don't care where they are on the issue, the Muslim Zionists, the Anzal, it doesn't make a difference. Everyone knows, unless they're, you know, I don't know, you know, I mean, there are crazies everywhere. We have lunatics. We have terrorists that go and kill Jewish babies. We have... Jews just happened, took a, a 16 year old Arab boy and murdered him after three Jews were murdered and went and burnt to the... But everyone understands that's political. So you cannot... If Look, it's a very real problem. I, I, I have to make this point. It's really a serious problem. I personally, I just want to be on the t record, I do not believe that Mahmoud Abbas with Sipi Livni... They don't represent anybody, okay? And it ain't happening. Yes, the poor kiddies in France, they're going to have all kinds of conferences, and the Americans are going to have things, and they're going to kind of stoop their way because everyone wants the legacy. It's not happening. That's my opinion. I'm not a prophet. God didn't tell me. But anybody who I think has eyes and ears knows that this, what's happening is political, and the solution will come from God. I believe that with everything in me. There's no way in the world that this issue can be solved by men. That's what I believe. That's all. It doesn't mean I have special things, but I think anybody... That's just my belief. So I'm say. We have to, however... It doesn't mean people watching the show who care about what's happening in the Holy Land, who are on one side or the other side, that it shouldn't ignite passion. So it is a very, very serious problem. But one one point has to be made that's absolutely axiomatic. No matter how you feel about the issue, the politics always poisons the issue of studying about God and theology. It means if you're it's fine. If It's a very serious problem. I'm not criticizing people who cannot detach themselves from it. When mothers are crying over their children over a grave, how can you? It's not easy. People who are scholars who study Muslim and uh, Jew, whatever it is, we have to, or else you'll never understand anything. So understand that politics is a disaster. It poisons everything. Vaharaya and the proof is in Islam. As it turns out, Islam does not have that many splits as Christianity. Not even remotely close. Christianity has hundreds, over a thousand Christian denominations, and they disagree on issues that there were Islamic sects, there were the 
deified Muhammad. I say the Islamic. To a Muslim, they're not Islamic. You're right, they're not. I'm just saying that they are a heresy of Islam. Jews had it. But the big, big, big split, there was a tremendous schism. And, of course, it was over politics. And that was uh, after the death of Muhammad. So then you had a question of... How, who would then be the next leader of the Islamic State and so on, the caliphate, and there was a terrible situation, and there was a terrible murder, and that caused a split between uh, Sunni and Shia, uh, where today the Islamic world, I live in Indonesia, which is essentially predominantly Sunni by far, and if you go to, like, let's say, Iran, it's predominantly Shia, or uh, Iraq is predominantly Shia. The, it's important to know that that split was completely political. Shia believe in the same Quran. They believe that Muhammad was only a messenger. Now there are Sunnis. I used to study. I studied many times with Arabs all the times, and they will tell me personally that Shias are idol worshippers. I, I will say that there is that goes on, but the split. Anyone who knows anything knows that that split was completely political, and then it, it was a disaster. It was. But, and Islam had other sects. They had people who claimed to be prophets after, after Muhammad, which is against the Quran because the teachings of Islam are very clear that Muhammad was the seal of prophets. The Arabic word is identical to the Hebrew word, and uh, the Hebrew word, and therefore there can be no messenger, meaning no prophet after Muhammad. Thus, anyone who claims to be a prophet after Muhammad in Islam is a complete heretic. There were such people. There were Shia that did worship Ali. They were. And they were thrown out the window. There were people who did would deify Muhammad. And that's considered the ultimate blasphemy. The blasphemy of blasphemy. There's nothing you could do. You could spit on a Muslim's mother's face, and it won't be as offensive as saying that Muhammad was divine. That's a worse. You can spit in a, a man's mother's face, God forbid, and that will, believe me, offend him. But that's nothing like saying Muhammad was a divine. So, now, Christianity, on the other hand, is all over the place. Christianity, you have, oh my gosh, you have, you had in the early state, you had, you had Herod, yeah, Her, I don't know, Herod, I, even do, I have a whole chapter in my book in volume one on this. You had the Marcionites who believed there were two different gods, the Bionity, who believed there was a god of the Old Testament, the Jewish Bible, the god of the New Testament. You had Gnostics who believed in hundreds of gods who were Christians. Not all Gnostics were Christians, but many of them were. And they believed in 20 gods, or 12 gods, or 300 gods. You had groups that thought that Jesus was not God at all. They thought he was partly God. He was completely God. You had the schism of the 11th century. You had the you know, East. You had East-West. You had the Reformation of the 16th century. Christianity is whoa, all over the place. And in contrast to Islam, Shia and Sunni never argued. I mean, I'm talking about mainstream Sunnis. There was great Sunnis and Shia never argued. Of what are the proper, what are the books of the Quran, which are that are that sacred? Because there's nothing more sacred than the Quran to a Muslim. They never disagreed that Muhammad was uh, the greatest and final prophet. Never. The tragedy is, it's political. And polit politics is a disaster. It poisons everything. But there were other, but th you can't compare. Is Islam was far, far, nothing, nothing touches Christianity as far as being by far the most variegated religion that ever existed in human history. Final thought on that. I'm um, thinking what I'm seeing uh, from what I'm learning from you and from uh, m Muslims that I know uh, based on what I hear on the news, like you said, and all this other stuff, is um, in, in, a, in a way to compare what's going on in Islam with what happened to Christianity. I mean, you very well taught, as well as other rabbis, that Christianity today is nothing at all like first century Christianity was when it, when it, when it first was birthed. It's completely transmogrified into something totally uh, off the wall, per se. And so it's not unlikely that it could happen to another, you know, to another group of people. I can break that down much further. Christianity in the year 95 is nothing like it was in the year 30. Who has to leave the first century? But in the earliest Christians who are identified by Christian church fathers in the patristic writings, you don't even have Jews. Jews don't have any first century contempt. Not, there's no one really. But the, we know from Christian writings, that means these are not hostile writings, that there were early groups, Ebionites and 
Nazarenes, and so on. These are groups that pff, hated Paul and considered Paul a liar and a fraud and a fa Look, if you read the letters of Paul, you don't need to go to the second century. I could speak for 12 hours on, when I say diversity, it's not like, oh, what color do you like? I like periwinkle blue. No. And we're talking about massive change from Christians who believe that Paul was the biggest liar that ever walked on two feet, who tried to abolish, and we see a reflection as in the Christian Bible, Paul is accused of, are you coming to change the law? Acts is very different than the letters of Paul. I don't want to get into this. So we can go back to the year 30. Now, we, there is no Christian literature from the year 30. This is a very critical point. We have the earliest Christian literature is the year 50 from First Thessalonians, the letters of Paul. It means we have 20 years of zero, nothing. From 30 to 50, you have nothing. But there are, it's too, it's beyond the scope of this program, but there are what are called pre-literary pre texts. And if you take graduate courses in Christianity, you'll, it'll, it'll be a course called Hymns and Creeds, where there are some texts which Christians believe predate the writing, let's say Romans 1, Philippians 2, and so on. I'm not going to get into it. But the key point is, is we know from the writings of Paul, who is Paul fighting? Paul's letters, his authentic letters, I mean authentic means they come from the same person, they're not forgeries from the later period, were all written in the 50s, right? Let's say 50s, right? So who is Paul fighting? Who is his enemies? He's fighting everywhere, and there is no way Paul invented those fights. Why? It's embarrassing. So if those fights were happening. What we see even between Paul and Peter in, in Galatians, they were screaming to his face and so. Who would invent something so embarrassing to the church? So who is Paul fighting? By his own words, he's fighting against fellow followers of Jesus, fellow, we'll call them, we have to call them Christians just because it's a conventional term, and what were the Christians teaching that Paul said was a false gospel? He was saying it was people who said that if you're a Christian, you have to keep the tire, you have to keep the law, you have to be circumcised. So who is he talking to? He's not talking to the Babachers. He's not talking to uh, someone who goes to the young Israel. He's talking to fellow Christians who believe that, what are you talking about? What is believing that Jesus is the Messiah have anything to do with not keeping Shabbos, not putting on tefillin, not keeping in the mitzvahs? We see that openly everywhere. And Paul would come, would write to churches that he established, whether in, in Galatians, which are written in, in, let's say, to Asia Minor, that he established in Corinth, going, in Galatians he says, who bewitched you with all this? Uh, so the fighting... The diversity, the transition, and then when we get, I'm skipping everything here, we can get to the book of John written, let's say, the year 90, that's the last of the four Gospels, a very improved, I say improved, I mean, John is already, whoa, in, improved over improvement over improvement over Mark. John, we have the prologue already with Jesus is not God, which some people say it's not, but he is already a God. That means he is already moving. Christianity has already left Jerusalem a long time ago and already has moved to Athens. It's now in Greece. It's now in the Empire. It's in Rome. It's not in... It's it's gone under Jerusalem. That's the first thing. I didn't even touch the second אשר מלך בטרם כל יציר נברא ואת נעשה בחפצו כל אזי מלך, אזי מלך שמו נקרא ואחרי כפלות הכל לבדו, אם לא כנועה, והוא היה, והוא עובד, והוא עובד, והוא יהיה בתפארה. אדון עולם אשר מלך בטרם כל יציא נברא לעת נשא וחפצה כל אזי מלך שמו נקרא ואחרי ככלות הכל לבדו ימלוך נורא והוא היה והוא עובר והוא יהיה בתפארה אדון עולם אשר מלך בטרם כל יציא נברא לעת נשא וחפצה כל אזי מלך שמו נקרא ואחרי ככלות הכל לבדו ימלוך נורא והוא היה והוא עובר בתפארה והוא עובר והוא יהיה בתפארה אדון עולם אשר מלך בטרם כל 
יציר נברא, את השר ורפץ הכל, אזי מלך, אזי מלך שמו נקרא, ואחרי ככלות הכל לבדו, אם לא כנועה, והוא היה, והוא עובד, והוא עובד, והוא יהיה בטיפה. אדון עולם השם הלך בטרם כל יציר נברא לעת עשה וחץ הכל הזי מלך שמו נקרא ואחרי ככלות הכל לבדו עם אחורה והוא היה והוא עובד והוא יהיה בתפארה אדון עולם השם הלך בטרם כל יציר נברא לעת עשה וחץ הכל הזי מלך שמו נקרא ואחרי ככלות הכל לבדו עם אחורה והוא היה והוא עובד בתפארה והוא עובד והוא יהיה בתפארה אזי מלך, אזי מלך, שמו נקרא. אדון עולם, השם הלך, בטרם כל יציא נברא לעת נשא בחפץ הכל, אזי מלך, שמו נקרא, ואחרי תכלות הכל לבדו, אם לא כנועה, והוא היה והוא עובד, והוא יהיה בתפארה. אדון עולם, השם הלך, בטרם כל יציא נברא לעת נשא בחפץ הכל, אזי מלך, שמו נקרא, ואחרי תכלות הכל לבדו, אם לא כנועה, והוא היה והוא עובד, בתפארה, והוא עובד, והוא יהיה בתפארה, והוא היה והוא עובד, בתפארה, והוא עובד, והוא יהיה בתפארה.